some experiences that I would like to share with you. Uh, philosophy about life that I hope that you will listen to and hopefully learn something from. I have been injured through my sport, but my story is universal. And I hope that you can see the parallel to your own lives, even though you might never wish to throw yourself off of a thousand meter cliff. My life as a professional skier and a base jumper, it has allowed me experiences that many people would consider living the dream. I've been on top of the podium in competitions all over the world. I've walked the red carpet and had champagne at my own movie premieres. And I've signed autographs to little kids with stars in their eyes. But I've also learned that it has its price to pay. When I was in elementary school, my teacher, she asked me if I could come and tell about my dreams. I came back to the class and I told them about how I dreamt about flying like the birds. For me, the birds, I thought they must be the happiest creatures in the world. I admire their capability of flying in the sky and playing up there with the clouds. They looked so untouched by everything around them. And they looked so free. I wanted to feel that same kind of freedom that those birds had. So I, I wanted to learn how to fly. My teacher, she told me that it was a nice dream. But I had to learn how to be more realistic in life. Because people... Well, people, they don't fly. I'm going to show you a little movie clip about what I think of exactly that. you think, but it sure gave me the feeling of flying. August 20th, 2006, that day my life was turned upside down. I was in Villeneuve, it's a small village at the foot of the Swiss Alps. It's, uh, it was World Cup in, in paragliding, it was a huge show, and I was invited there to jump, I was going to fly my wingsuit, and I was going to entertain in the breaks. I sat inside the plane and I, I looked out the little window as we rose up towards the sky. We flew low in between grassy hills and snowy mountaintops. Switzerland has a really beautiful landscape. And I was thinking that, wow, I must be the luckiest girl ever. I was living my dream. How could I wish for anything more? The atmosphere inside the plane was light. And the laughs, they came easily. There was nothing to be worried about or, or nervous about. We had done this hundreds of times before. We were going to fly our wingsuits, we were going to entertain, but most importantly, we were just going to have fun. We jumped out of the airplane. I was having a camera that was attached to my helmet, filming the others in the sky. We flew side by side, over and under each other, while the smoke that we had attached to our leg, it followed our every move and created a beautiful pattern in the sky. And as I flew by my friend, I could see her smile. And I was like, yes, it's a perfect jump. And then it was time to release the parachute and land safely on the grassy field in front of the spectators. And as I opened the chute, I could hear the clapping and the shouting from the thousands of spectators underneath me. 
They were ecstatic, and I let out a scream of pure happiness. And then I realized that something had gone wrong. Ten seconds later, my life changed forever. I'm going to show you a little movie clip of what I saw on that actual day. With more than 100 kilometers per hour, I was lucky to hit a rock when I hit the ground. It crushed everything that I had from my hips and down. I had four fractures in my left femur, I had two broken knees, and I had 21 open fractures in my right side. But that rock, it saved my back, and it saved my head, and most importantly, I was still alive. But the hours after my accident, they were dramatic. I had lost almost four liters of blood, and the task was now to save my life. I woke up two days later at a hospital in Lausanne to a doctor who told me that I was lucky to still be alive, but that I was never going to be able to walk again. My greatest fear, it had now become a reality. How do you start up as a base jumper? I met uh, an American, a professional American base jumper at an extreme sports competition. And I told him that I had a dream to learn how to base jump. Him? He said, like every American does, come to me, I'll teach you. But I did as he said. And a month later, I, I was at the airport in Los Angeles waiting for a guy that I'd hardly known for a week. He taught me how to pack my parachute and what to do in case of an emergency. But unfortunately, he wasn't listening quite to his own advice. So at our first jump together, my friend, he broke his ankle on a downwind landing. And this kind of created a dilemma for my training. What was I going to do? I'd come all the way from Norway to the US in order to learn. Was, gonna, was I going to travel all the way back? Mm -mm. The answer? was distance education. Me, I was climbing around on the steel with the walkie-talkie, while my friend, he was sitting in his car with the other hand of the walkie-talkie. My friend, he, let, he dropped me off at the foot of the bridge at 3 o'clock in the morning. And there, I was going to sit behind a bush and hide and wait until my friend could drive to the bottom of the bridge and just check that the wind conditions were fine and everything was good to go. And to sit like this, hiding behind the little bush, and listen to the sounds from the river underneath me, and then the sounds from the, the forest behind me, that would probably have been a really nice experience if it wasn't for the fact that, well, I'm scared of the dark and I just forgot to tell him. So just as I'm about to get up and tell him, that, hey, I don't want to do this, let's, let's go home. Then I hear my friend's voice on the walkie-talkie. Everything's okay here. And to my surprise, I answer, okay, copy that. And I get up just like a machine, and I start climbing steel underneath the bridge. And to climb the steel with a boulder field 60 to 70 meters underneath you without any kind of protection, it's a little bit of a hairy warm-up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But I finally made it up to a catwalk that stretched out underneath the bridge. I geared up and checked that everything was okay. I walked to the middle of the bridge and I climbed over the rail. And as I stood there on the outside of the rail, down there, 150 meters down, I, th I saw three little green light sticks that my friend had laid out on the path 
in order to create a runway for me so that I could see in the dark. Huh, I thought, that was nice of him. I counted down. Three, two, one, see ya! No, I counted down again and again, but I wasn't moving. Well, that's not exactly right, because my legs were shivering like leaves. This wasn't working out. I had to climb back over the rail to collect myself. I took a couple of deep breaths. What were my options? One, I could climb back down the same way that I came up. But we all know that climbing down is even worse than climbing up. So I didn't dare to do that. I had to think we're rational. Well, the fastest way for me off of this bridge, back to my friend, back to that warm, nice, light car, well, that's to jump off this bridge. And then it became an easy decision. I climbed back over the rail, and on three, two, one, I jumped out into the dark and started my life as a base jumper. We're going to go back to 2006. My first stay in the hospital was over, and it was time for rehab. Moving to the rehab center, that was supposed to be a step in the right direction, a step forward. But it didn't quite turn out the way that I wanted it to. Because for the first time since my accident, I now saw other injured people. Suddenly I was surrounded by other people who were sitting there in their wheelchairs with amputated arms and amputated legs. When I was in hospital, I had had a single room and with just my healthy friends and, and, and nurses visiting. And the first day that I was in rehab, a man held a speech about learning how to live with your handicap. I thought, I had to get out of here. I wasn't going to learn to live with my handicap. What part is it that they don't understand around here? I'm going to get healthy. And then I realized that I wasn't any different from all the other people sitting there in their wheelchairs. I was one of them. We were all there to make the best out of our new situation. I cried every day for a week. I had no powers. I saw no light at the end of the tunnel and I had no hope. I'd used my body for everything that I did ever since I was a little girl. I loved skiing and being in the mountains and all my friends. And I also realized that there are different ways of making it to where you want to go. And the contrast between skiing down an untouched face in Alaska with cameras that are following your every move and then learning the gravity in a sit-ski for handicapped people. That contrast is huge. And the lack of fear that used to be my trademark, both as a skier and a base jumper, it was now replaced with an irrationality and a pain that was felt on my body that wouldn't let go. But still, knowing that my body couldn't take any kind of impact Still, the enormous joy of being able to be back in the mountains and back with my friends, it overruled any sense. And feeling the chill, the wind chill on my face and the little snow sprays as I was rushing, skiing down the hill, it made me realize why I was working so hard to make it, or to hopefully make it back one day. Now I'm going to show you a little film clip of, uh, of that time.
by little, I would take it one step further, and, and I don't really want to stop until, until I can do it all. I was alone. I had no family of my own, and I had no boyfriend, and I was selfish. I had prepared for the fact that I could die through the activity that I had chosen. But what I wasn't prepared for, that was what was in between. To be stuck in a wheelchair, that was suddenly to take responsibility for my own actions. Now I was the one who had to get up every morning and go out there and work out. I had to handle the everyday life. People used to tell me that I was tough. He was base jumping. It's not tough to jump out of cliffs. What is tough is to wake up every morning and go out there and work out when you have nothing else to look forward to than another operation. And you don't know whether there will be a light at the end of that tunnel. A friend of mine, he told me that you know that this accident saved your life, he said. <laughs> uh, no, well, how is that possible, I told him. Well, because in the direction that you were going, you probably wouldn't have survived if it wasn't for the fact that this accident stopped you. Well, luckily, I will never have the answer to that question. But what I do know is that I was on a carousel that I loved and that I'd yearned for. And what we know about carousels is that when they speed up, they just go faster and faster, and eventually they throw their passengers off. My carousel, it had definitely sped up, and I had figured out I thought it was time for a new challenge. I had heard of another American, this time a guy called Shane McConkie. He had combined the two sports that I loved the most. He had taken skiing, and base jumping and put it together to something like a James Munn stunt that he called ski base. And a ski base, that basically meant that you would ski down an untouched mountain face that ended up in a mandatory 200 meter cliff, jump out, open the parachute, land safely on the ground. The only problem was that those skis, those heavy skis on your legs, they created an enormous drag and they would make this the, probably the most dangerous combination. Perfect, I thought. Exactly what I need right now. I called him up and asked him if he was willing to teach me. Shane? Well, he answered like every American does. Come to me. I'll teach you. So again, I was on my way over to the US and I met up with Shane and his friend. Shane, he had brought fireworks and I got to choose the color pink for my fireworks. Because Shane, he celebrated, because I was the first and the only woman in the world who had combined the two sports. I'm gonna show you a little film clip of what that means. I finished my 20th surgery and uh, rehab in January in 2009. That's about four and a half years ago. I'd, I had re then reached a goal that nobody thought was possible. I'd stood up from my wheelchair and I tossed away my crutches and I had learned how to walk again. And at this time, goals, Goals are important, we all heard that. But goals, for me, they were extremely important. And what is a good goal, really? A good goal is a goal that triggers you. A goal that forces you to feel something, anger, happiness, something. And that's what this goal did for me. And, but sometimes goals, they can feel unrealistic. And my goals, they were definitely unrealistic. But instead of being demoralized by the greatness or the vastness 
of that goal. I decided to break it down into little pieces, into one day at a time. And by doing that, the goal wouldn't feel so overwhelming. And it wouldn't feel like I was eating the entire elephant at the same time. And when I was in rehab, when you're in rehab, you need to have goals. So when I was in rehab, I weighed about 45 kilos. That's more than 20 kilos less than I weigh today. And my goals were, my near future goal, that was to sit upright in my wheelchair throughout an entire meal. That lasted at least 10 minutes before I had to go and, and rest. But my far future goal, that was always to come back to my skiing and come back to my mountains again. And I think that the, the nurse who was sitting there writing down my goals, she had to cover up her smile a little bit as she looked at that little sparrow who was sitting there in the wheelchair with these enormous goals. But today, today I'm the one who gets to smile. And I get to smile because a little over two years ago, I made it back to the mountains and back to my powder skiing again. And it took me about four years of training, of uncertainty and fear of failure to make it back to that mountain. But the joy of making it back, that's what made me a complete person again. And to be able to feel that jiggerish feeling that I dreamt for, and I didn't really even know if I dared to believe in. It was almost, it was too good to be true. And exploring, exploring is not all about mountaintops and untouched terrain. It's about challenging yourself and discovering your abilities, no matter what field is yours. I'm going to show you a last movie clip, and this is my first day back in the mountains after four years of training. Staring at the sea, across the way. I've seen that clip hundreds of times and it still makes me happy seeing it. The last question that you guys might be wondering is, um, do I regret? Do I regret my choice of lifestyle? No, nah, I don't regret. I don't know if I'll ever be able to base jump again. I don't know if I would want to even, or if I would dare to. But what I do know is that even if I would have had to spend the rest of my life in that wheelchair, I wouldn't have regretted it. Not one single jump. I've dreamt about flying, and I've dreamt about learning how to walk again. And I'm still that little girl, dreaming. But now I've learned that dreaming, well, that's not all about being realistic, is it? 
Because I don't know what you think is more realistic, learning how to fly or learning how to walk. Thank you very much.